Okay, in its 05, I think we can get started. Um, it, we will organize it like this. Um, I will first talk 45 minutes until 12.45, 12.50. You can ask me questions during the talk, anytime. We will see maps, you have any curiosity about the special map, you ask me. But at the end, we'll have around 10 minutes of Q&A. After that, basically at one, we'll move up, but in two groups, because the gallery is quite small. So we take around 20 people at a time. You're around 40, so there will be a first group sitting at the back that will go first. And then the group that stays can have a look at these maps, and you can ask questions uh, about the maps for the staff waiting there. They will be able to answer your question. And then the second group will go up, and basically uh, you will both have a 15 minutes short exhibition tour. And, but anyway, really ask questions anytime. Now, the topic uh, of this talk is the same topic of the exhibition upstairs, that is Tartary. Tartary is Central Asia. Now, let me first tell you how we selected the map. The maps are from our own collection. We got this collection in the mid 90s, around 20 years ago. Uh, there are more than 100 ancient European printed maps of China. So, ancient means this range 1500 to 1750. They are printed, so they could not be before 1450 when the printing age started in Europe, in China, started much earlier. So out of these more than 100 maps printed European and mostly about China and East Asia, I selected all the maps that talk about Tartary, Central Asia. But it's not the same as Central Asia, because maps tell you the story of how people see the space, different places and their ideas about these places change. So this concept of Tartary, I will tell you in a moment, changing is not just exactly Central Asia, but it's connected with the Tartars, with the Mongols. It's connected with the big part from Europe to China that is nomadic. Now, one more information about the maps. So we, we got them all from the UK. We got them from a dealer. We bought them. They are printed maps. That means there are more than one copy. So we got one copy in the 90s of each of them. There are other copies in other parts of the world, in other museums, in other universities. These maps come from quite a few countries, but you will see why we go through the map, that they focus on Italy and the Netherlands, and some from Germany at the beginning. So I'm just giving you a um, small map of Europe in the middle of this period. The period we have for the maps is 1500 to 1750. So something around 1650 shows you where these maps came from. Some from Italy. There was no Italy as a country, but this is Italy as a, as a geographical area. Then Germany. Again, there was no Germany as a country. Yeah, at the time, it was the Holy Roman Empire. And then, very important, the Netherlands. Now, these maps were printed in these places. Mostly the maps are not in German or Dutch. If you are in Italian, mostly they are in Latin. That was the international language at the time. That was the way for map makers to spread their maps all over Europe. Because unlike Chinese maps or maps from the Middle East, maps in Europe were made with the purpose of being sold. Really, when people study the history of European cartography, sometimes they say mapping for money. They were printing, and they wanted to sell their printed maps. So they had to circulate widely, and that was why they were in Latin. Everybody would understand Latin at the time, at least for the basic part. I will show you some more details. But before we go into the main part of my talk, which is really showing you images. We will zoom in on the maps we have, mostly upstairs. I will give you a bit of background. 
the way to see Central Asia this part between Europe and China doesn't only come from Europe. And we will show you maps from Europe, but this is not the only tradition that had a look at this area. Central Asia has been described by Chinese cartography and has been described by uh, Middle Eastern Islamic cartography. But after giving you this idea and after telling you why European maps started being so important around 1500 that basically they are most of the story we have about modern cartography. They, they become really the most important one. But before, uh, there are really these three different um, traditions. Uh, then something happens in the West so that basically that tradition becomes more important. And then uh, we'll simply see uh, map by map. Now, if you look at 1300, uh, this is a map, well, first of all, it's not printed, unlike the one that we show you. This is on parchment. Basically, it's on, on skin animal, cows mostly. Large, uh, you get the whole cow. You can basically, this would be the neck of the cow. You would uh, treat it with salt, you would make it preserved, you, you would make it suitable for writing, basically. And then, obviously, all of these are unique. I mean, you're just one person writing on a specific piece of, not even paper, but we call it vellum, anyway. And the kind of maps they would do in Europe, this is 1300, the Middle Ages, Hereford map is a famous British map. Uh, obviously, if you go, um, and to the British Library, you will see much more details. But this is a general image, and this is a kind of key to the map. So this map is not only about finding your own way in your city, or even just understanding where China is compared to, I don't know, Mongolia or Japan, or uh, having really a clear relationship in space between countries. This is a map that. Tells you something about the world, how the people believe the world was, but it also tells you something about deep meaning. And the deep meaning here, there is paradise, I mean, at the top. So this is a tradition of map making that basically visualizes what people thought was important at their time. And important at the time was not only how to go from A to B, especially if you had a map of the world. Map of the world was not really to be used to travel. But it was used to make sense of the world. And to make sense of the world for people in the Middle Ages was basically to tell you, where do you go after you die? What is the meaning of our existence? Why Jesus came to save us? These were the questions that people asked. And these were the questions that people asked even when they looked at the map of the world. So Jerusalem is at the center. In a lot of tradition, we will see, looking at the Chinese map, and later at the European maps, People put themselves at the center. So European map generally has Europe at the center, even modern maps of the world. If you're made in Europe, you see Europe at the center, then there is Asia at one side, then the Atlantic and America. If you go to America, you will see America at the center, then the two oceans, and so on. China had the same. Your own country at the center. But these people were not really interested in their own country. Jerusalem is at the center. Jerusalem is the holy city for Christians. So it is at the center. And the rest, you can see, is quite imprecise. But it's still oriented. It's still oriented with the east on top. Because all maps didn't have our convention of north on top. It's just a convention that the herd is round. The earth is round, so you can have north or south on top. You can orient the maps like you like. But orient to find a position really means to find the east. It comes from the tradition of having east at the top. To orient means to find the eastern, to position yourself basically with east as the center. This is to give you. Mm -hmm. In the in the 1300s, do people actually realize that paradise were on Earth, or rather they were on like other planets that's around Earth? I thought like Dante wrote about it about yeah, approximately Dante. that time. So, so do you not think paradise would be on Earth at <laughs> that time? Uh, it, it's a good question, and, and, and Dante certainly had his own ideas of where to position paradise, but actually 
I've been short, and, and this map shows you paradigm, but when they say paradigm, they actually mostly mean Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is positioned in the east, according to the map. Uh, and you can kind of orient yourself. When you, Dante has a map, when you, when you read the Holy Comedy, the, the, the most important work of Italian literature written really in this place, in this time, Dante tells the story of himself having a vision, but he doesn't say it's a vision. He says he really traveled with his own body. It's a real travel. And he says it happened in 1300, just that year. So it's a real travel. And he tells you how to go down to hell at the center of the earth. He tells you how to go to the Mount of Purgatory, with the intermediate stage that is opposite to hell on the other side of the earth. But paradise is in the sky. And it's basically no real place in Dante's idea. So the earthly paradise, that means Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, people had an idea where it was. They want, because it happens on Earth. Uh, but the real paradise is really a no, no, not a place. But obviously, it's still a big stretch. It doesn't certainly tell you about any exploration that they made where they put paradise. There was a reason to put paradise in the east, because that was the origin. That was the most important point. And we came from paradise on Earth, and we want to go back to paradise in heaven. But for China, it's different. Uh, China, at the time, had maps. Well, these come from uh, actually a stone, but they were already having in printing in 1137, when I showed this map. And they had grids. So if you compare it with the 1300 European maps, it's quite clear which tradition is more accurate in representing land. Uh, the second map, this is from the Song Dynasty. This is a Korean map, now very famous, called the Kanido map. It's a map of the world. It's a map of the world that corresponds to the idea that we all think that we are ourselves at the center. But it's a Korean map. Korea recognized that China is at the center. So China is at the center. Korea is out of size because it's a Korean map. <laughs> it always happens like this in cartography. Your own country has a special tree. At the same time, the notions they had about Africa, about Europe, are quite significant. Obviously, there is no America. Nobody has found America. There are books about the fact that Chinese found America in 1420, not very reliable. Uh, but this tradition of the East Asia was more, much more advanced than it was the Western tradition at the time. Uh, we are showing some maps there. So I'm clicking on one of these maps here uh, and having you have a look. Now, so this is really the big map there at the back. All our maps, all the maps I'm going to show you, are online in our e that rare and special e -zone. And you can use them very nicely. I mean, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. This is basically a map of the great Qin dynasty, but representing the whole world. So it is conceived just like the medieval map as a world map, or this Korean Kanido map. This has China as the center. You can zoom in and see. This is Beijing, quite clearly. It's very important. It's at the north. It's more or less where it should be. Let me see if you can see more detail. Tiananmen. So this map tells you what, what the center is. It's Beijing. At the same time, this map, and here it lists basically all all the Chinese provinces at the top with data, surface, population, and so on. And then, because it's a map of the world, uh, here it's England. Here it's the Netherlands. You can see it if you zoom in later. Here it's Russia. And that's it. More or less, the rest of the world is this narrow strip. Now, if you compare it with what we had before, With this, you will see that it's much more, much less realistic. Uh, 
is much less realistic even than this Korean map. This map that I showed you, oh, uh, it's a map from 1818. So it, it's a recent map, relatively speaking. I mean, it's a map when in the West they were already doing very modern maps that we, you would recognize as a map from an atlas. So, but this doesn't so much show you that China is backward, but it shows you that people choose to represent different things in maps. Maps are not only used for one thing. Even people in the Middle Ages knew that you cannot really travel far to the east and go to Siberia and find the Garden of Eden and Paradise. They, they wanted to show what is the real meaning of the world. When Chinese were having these maps printed and hanged, it's not that they thought they were really realistic representation, especially of the rest of the world, but they were reminded of how powerful the empire under the Qing was, how rich in population, how much surface it was, how much was really the center. So maps are, if you look at our map, because they are from 1500 to 1750, and you look at most of the maps, if you look from the point of view of how accurate did they get it, how good they were, then you would be disappointed most of the time. You don't look at this map trying to find if they are like Google Maps, because then they are not like Google Maps. But they have a lot of other things inside. They really show you what these people wanted to represent, a way to visualize, to make really clear in front of you what is important. Only there is a science part, there is a distance. But at the time of the Song Dynasty, they wrote and, and before, there were very clear treatises on how you should, you should draw a map, how you should be faithful to distance, and they had perfectly clear that concept. They just decided when going on mostly with maps like this, that that was not really what they were interested in, that when they were hanging a map, they wanted to see something different. Uh, this is the other third tradition that is important in, um, in Western cartography. And in, in war cartography, and it's the Muslim tradition. I put it upside down because um, Arabic maps actually have south on top, but it would be difficult to recognize it with the south on top. Uh, with north on top, upside down, you quite see this is Italy, this is Europe, Middle East, Arabia, North Africa, and then Asia. More or less. In the West, 1300, we had that map just with Garden of Eden and many symbols. In 1482, more or less close to the time of Columbus, we get maps that start looking like our modern maps. The, the Greeks had this concept of Greek cartography, just like we saw in the Song Dynasty Chinese maps, squares. Reading the Greek text, they went back to that, and they just designed, this is Europe, this is Africa, this is Asia, they designed it in a way that they had longitude and latitude for all locations. Obviously, many things are unknown here, East Asia, unclear border. Not only they have the idea from the Greeks of having a grid, but they get much more information. The information they have, uh, this is upside down from our point of view, meaning south on top, north at the bottom. But this is easier to understand because there is a kind of explanation here. So India here, Kataya, that is China, on this side. And then Europe here, Alemania means Germany, and then Tartaria, what we actually are focused in the exhibition, the Central Asia part. Which brings me to the fact of where Tartary comes from. And just to put it in a way that is a bit easy to understand and resonate with some people. So it all comes from Marco Polo. Marco Polo went to the Mongol Empire between 1271 and 1295. Traveled, first went by land from Italy to China, then came back by sea. Uh, he wrote a book about it, the travels in Italian in Milione. And in this book, he tells a lot of things about China, uh, including the fact that it's dominated by the Mongols that are, at the time, at the name of Tartars. So the whole area 
between here and here is called Tartaria. And also, he has these two different names for China. He doesn't recognize China as one country. So the Mongols had first conquered North China and then South China. The two countries were administratively separated. And the North was called Katai, and the South was called Manji. When we look at our map, we will see that this goes on a lot. Now, did Marco Polo go to China? Uh, every 10 years, there is a book that tells you he didn't go to China. Um, there is only one straight way that you can have an answer if you're basically an archive, or, or, or not if he's basically mentioned in histories, official history of China. He was not that important that he would appear in history. If you read the book, he, he tells you that he's actually quite close to Kublai Khan, the great emperor, but it's quite clear this is not accurate. So he's not a person that would be in history books. In the Venetian archive, he's, he's a person that is not. There is a contract about him giving money to his daughter to marry. So Chinese archive, we don't have Chinese archives that compare to that, uh, that would keep data of private people in, in the country. So we cannot be sure in the sense of 100% sure. What we can be sure is that his information is accurate about China. He doesn't mention things he, we think he should mention. He doesn't mention tea, he doesn't mention the Great Wall, he doesn't mention his foot binding, but he mentioned many other things that scholars believe he could not have made up. It really required somebody that went to the country. What is sure is that basically he gave information that for centuries in Europe took as the basis of what China is. For He went there in 1300 until 1700 people were using his book to understand what China was. This is a kind of extreme example. It's upstairs if you want to have a look. Kinzai is the name Marco Polo gives to Hangzhou, the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty, the largest city in the world at the time. This is a map from 1600. It's a Dutch map. Most people, most maps were made in the Netherlands, they were Dutch at the time. And it shows Kinzai as it was, as an illustration of Marco Polo's book. And this is a kind of an answer of, did Marco Polo go to China? Meaning, he saw certain things. He saw it with the eyes of an European. And other Europeans read the book and had their own image about China. And this image about China is often very different from anything you can actually see in China. I mean, this is supposed to be Hangzhou. And Marco Polo said there is a lake, as there is. Uh, and then he said there are a lot of canals, like Venice, it came from Venice. And then uh, the, he, doesn't, he didn't have a map himself, he doesn't have illustrations. So centuries later, people read his book, and as reality, they would draw maps of cities like this, that from our point of view are are they China at all? Uh, this is the only, this comes from an atlas of important cities in the world. There are 300. Uh, there is mainly Europe, and then there is Istanbul, there are Cairo, and there are cities in America. This is the only map of China, of a city in China. So it, it's more fantasy than reality. But this is because people just, at the time, mostly read books instead of going to a place and take measures. So Marco Polo most likely went to China, but people who read the book just went on and made it more and more fantastic, just like this image. At the same time, this image was not fantasy. It was in a book really of city views. Now, let me give you some of the maps in our collection. So this is the oldest we have. Let me zoom in, because zoom in is something you can do yourself uh, online, uh, going to, to this LPE zone, the library E zone. And let me show you, I mean, I'm trying basically to give you an idea of not only the collection and not only the maps upstairs, you can also see them by yourself, but how to look at a map, what is the way, what maps really represent. But this is a map of the world. It's from 1493, it's one year after the discovery of America. It comes from a book of the most highly illustrated book at the time, printed in German. Uh, Germans were very strong, they invented printing. So they went on printing books for 100 years, being the most efficient printers. Uh, and it puts many things together. Uh, again, the Bible, we don't have paradise here, 
uh, but we had the three sons of Noah, Yafet, Sam, and Tom. So after the, the flood, Noah basically uh, is able to rescue himself and his children, and the three children repopulate the world. Yafet stands for Europe, Sam for Asia, and Tom from Africa. So it's a geography of the world that corresponds to what people knew in the ancient times, but it's also connected with the Bible. <coughs> it's printing. Printing was not in color at the time, so it's hand colored, printed in black and white, and each copy is hand colored. But it would be colored the same way, because basically printers would instruct their people to use certain color coding. So green, yellowish brown, pinkish. There are other things. Well, first of all, there is Tartaria from the point of view of other situations. So Central Asia is here. T-A-R-T-A-R-I-A. Tartaria. And then there are also strange creatures that you see when you move far away from home. People with six arms, kind of furry woman, kind of monkey almost, and half horse, half man person with three faces, kind of mixture of bird and man. These were considered to be the, they were called the wild creatures of the East. So people moving out of Europe were supposed to meet these kind of monsters, half human, half monster. In fact, Marco Polo is one of the few books that doesn't talk about it. Marco Polo, that's why many people find it much more believable. If you read books about the travels of the time, they tell you where you can reach paradise, they tell you where you find people with three faces and half birds and half men, Marco Polo really tells you mostly how much you pay if you move, say, from A to B, and how far is this place from that other place, or how incredible is the urban economy of Hangzhou because there are so many hundreds of thousands of people and so many bakers and, and he's really about, all about the economy. He was a merchant and he was really into measuring things. That's why he's considered much more believable. That is a map of the world. This is the only map of the world we have. This is a map of Asia. Now let me zoom in. Map of Asia, Sedica is the old name of China. And here, anthropophagy, man eaters. So, in, in this area that is basically the area of Tartaria, you have really people chopping humans on a board. Because when part of the meaning of this Tartaria, part of the attitude of Europeans toward the Mongols, that for them, Tartars were the Mongols, is that the Mongols started invading East, uh, Eastern Europe, and they, they were never defeated. They, they just crashed European armies in a row. They were seen to be unstoppable. Then the Great Khan died, and they were recalled back to Asia. So people were terrified. They just thought that Mongols were almost non-human, unstoppable, uh, barbarians a great danger. And so you often represent this feeling of complete alien, this kind of enemy that's a total alien, in the form of cannibals. Now there are other things here too. I mean there are uh, human with dog's heads or people with their faces on the chest. This goes back to the mess, this kind of wild races. I will skip some because I've been lingering on many other things. I will just show you quite quickly. This is another map. And here you have the Great Khan, just standing there. But keep in mind, with the Great Khan, this is a map from 1530. These are printed maps. So they, they must be from around 1500, because before there was no printing. Uh, it's a map from 1530, and it tells you about could be like Khan, who was there 200 years earlier. This is because people read the books, read the, the Marco Polo book. But there is a reason why they read the book. 
They read the book because with the fall of the Mongol Empire, the Silk Road, the commercial way to go safely from Europe to China was closed. So this flow of information also stopped, which means you had to rely on the best you had. And the best you had was 200 years earlier information from Marco Polo. Now here, I will show you three maps of the, quickly in succession, of the most important map maker of his time. 1580, his name is Ortelius, is the first that created the atlas. He gets a name, atlas is the, is a book that collects maps of the world in order. Probably could be 50, 100, basically it's a comprehensive book that gives you maps of the world. Before Ortelius, before 1580s, no such book existed. He created them, they had dozens of editions, and then there were also competition, other atlases. So he's really one of the great figures of map making. We have many of his maps. One of them, in fact, the one I mentioned here, is at the back there. So this is a map of Asia. There is Tartaria here at the top. It's very unclear, but maybe at least they know, compared to other maps, that there is an ocean. They know that there is an ocean, and in the second map of Ortelius, it's focused on Tartaria, only Tartaria, it's in Latin, so Tartaria, Sive Magni Kami Regni, that means Tartary or the Great Khan's Kingdom. These maps are in Latin. And similar to the other, there is Japan, it's here, and one thing to notice is that here you have the Great Khan. It's not a place, it should be in China, but it's put here, like in the middle of Central Asia. They say it's Kubila. And here you have the Tsar of Russia. Here, because here it's, it's, it's written in like in Duchis, Moscow. Yeah. So the, the king, basically the leader of Moscow. Moscow is the capital of Russia, that means the leader of, of Russia, the ruler of Russia. And he's just depicted the same way that, um, that the Mongols are depicted. So if we just zoom in a bit, we see it quite clearly. This is Magnus Khan, the great Khan, and this is the king of Russia, the ruler of Russia. Because at the time, even Russia was considered basically out of Europe, almost kind of wilderness, non-European non image. Another thing that is certainly not very scientific, but is quite lovable in these ancient maps are sea monsters. You will see many of them if you just pay attention. They're just, they're kind of decoration. I mean, certain people, there were books that sometimes it's not even easy to recognize what is the difference between a whale and, and an imaginary uh, fish at the time. Both of them were considered sea monsters at the time. We know the whale exists. And this thing at this size presumably cannot possibly exist. At the time, it was less clear for the people. But mostly they were used as decoration, just like this part is decoration, and this great title part with flowers is decoration. Maps are really a mixture of information and painting. They are used for entertainment as well as for information. But the most important map is this one, map of China. And it's still Ortelius, so they're three maps, same time, in this big atlas. And this map is not so much as here, north is here, south is here, west and east. So it's skewed to the way we are used to have it. Presumably, it's simply to fit the page. This is a double page. They all come from books. Our maps are not to be hanged. They all come from books. I will show you in a moment how you can see. So this is the middle of the page, and they just need to fit along China in this way. And, and North was not so important to be at the top, even though, generally speaking, if there are no other reason, North would be at the top. But what is important is this map, is that the names are using Portuguese romanization, they are pronounced in Portuguese, but they are Chinese names. This is X is Shi for Portuguese, Shandong. Ao is On, how Portuguese pronounce On, so Henan, Zhejiang, 
、南京、贵州、広東、福建。So, all these areas show that all these areas show that、uh, now they're not relying on Marco Polo anymore. There's not Katai and Manji the next few days to China. These names are names, Chinese names that actually don't make any sense to Europeans. They just write them down as they are pronounced. But, and this brings me to. Quickly, the background of these two maps, meaning why I, I mentioned in, in my talk, I, I would address a few issues and probably would leave many out because we are almost done already. But one issue is why did the Portuguese, that are such a small country, actually manage to be the only country controlling the China commerce for, for 100 years? Well, basically, the Italians would control the land route. There are things, China. China, where silk would arrive more or less overland slowly, not at the time, not like at the time of the Mongols, just one person doing all the trip. Many person, A sets to B, B sets to C, it goes through 20 intermediaries, becomes very expensive, it goes by land, and it reaches this part of Europe, the East, Italy, they control. But the Portuguese face the Atlantic, they cannot possibly hope to control the Mediterranean and get the silk. But they were very wise, and they had a three-generation effort to circumnavigate Africa and then reach China. And they did it, and they basically controlled yes, all this coast of Africa, Goa in India, Malacca. They founded the sea in Macau, and also Japan. This other part of Manila and Acapulco was controlled by the Spanish, and it basically tells you that this, at this time, around 1580, you can travel the whole world. You, there is really supply of China ware and silk would reach Acapulco in Mexico and could be re-exported to Europe. It was already global, the global world. But the Portuguese lasted like this for around 100 years, and they were never they were just a commercial power. They were not industrial power. They didn't print maps at all. No maps we have is printed by Portuguese. The maps we had before is printed in the Netherlands by this Dutch map maker. Even though the information is clearly from the Portuguese. The Dutch are the second power that basically supplanted the Portuguese. They took more or less what you needed to go to the east, good parts of Africa, South Africa, populated by, by Dutch. Uh, people south of China, uh, south of India, all of Indonesia, and, and Taiwan. They controlled Taiwan for quite a few decades. And not only they controlled the commerce, but they were the major industrial power in Europe. And so they printed most of the maps we have. They were the major printing uh, countries in Europe. Most of our maps are from the Dutch. Just here and there, let me show you what is, from now on, it's all Dutch maps. Before it was partly German, partly Italian, they are all Dutch. And Dutch maps were very decorative. Uh, this part has a title. Here it tells you this is the Tartaria part, the area of Tartary. But this is mainly a map of China. And it tells you two things that people thought China was very important for. Um, beside the, the, the great population and the richness, they had the idea that in China, people would have this kind of pre-modern automobile, this kind of uh, wind-operated charts on wheels. The first missionary writes it, and then every single map of China has some image showing that the Chinese people happily going like propelled by the wind and this high technology country that is conquering the world. Other things that they put on maps are more dramatic things. Japan, here they show crucifixion, people being crucified, because at the time Christians were basically uh, considered dangerous but the many missionaries had converted tens of thousands of Japanese to Christianity. They were considered dangerous 
by uh, the recently reunified country and they were crucified as a way to basically stop further conversion. And this is something that they show here. They, they, they say in Latin that they basically this is the criminal the way criminals are killed in Japan, and this is what happened to to Christianos, to Christians in Latin. Uh, which basically means maps are they give you an idea of how the world looks like, but they also tell you notable things, strange things that happen that are in the country and also events, events important at the time. They're a kind of multimedia at the time. You hang your maps and you're reminded of how diverse the world is, but also what going, is going on in the world. Now, from now on, these are all maps, and I will skip them because we, we don't really have much more time to do it. I will just show this one as an example. This is a map that has basically cities on top, people dressed in their ethnic costumes at the side and the map in the middle. So they are composite maps. They were whole books about cities. We, in fact, we saw Hanzhou from one of these books. They would reduce a map bigger than the one I show you into a very small part. They would put them all on the top, and then they would put this at the bottom, and then the rest would be a real map. But keep in mind, this is still Jerusalem. Yeah, if you zoom in. Quick, but at the center is still Jerusalem. All the other cities are important commercial cities. This is Macau. And if you if you zoom in, you see that actually Macau is kind of okay. I mean, they had a map, evidently. They, they, they knew how Macau was shaped. Uh, they are Goa, Damascus, important commercial city at the time. But Jerusalem is still at, in the center because it's mainly for religious reasons. Jerusalem was not a big commercial center at the there's another map of China. This is one of the few English maps. In fact, the title here is The Kingdom of China. All the others are Dutch or Italian. This is a map of China made by an Italian missionary. And he, in 1660, he had access to Chinese maps. Chinese maps were printed in atlases. They were commercial printing, even though not selling as much as our maps in the West. And he got an atlas of Chinese geography and he derived most of the information from that Ming Dynasty geographical book. At the same time, he was able to read it. He was able to add new information. He was able to give the right projection, measure the latitude of the cities. Um, and one thing he did, taking it from um, Chinese cartography, he introduced into Western cartography the symbol of uh, the dots to show the desert. This is something that comes from Chinese cartography and is now commonly used in world cartography. It's actually the only symbol that was used by Chinese cartography that has been incorporated into Western cartography. But it has been done because he was using Chinese maps and he found it convenient to show a desert that way. This is basically the Gobi Desert. Um, more maps, more maps of Tartaria. Let me just go to two maps that are more modern. This is English, published in London in 1715. Now, before it's mostly Italian, Germans, and Dutch. In 1700, it's mostly English and French, especially French. The French are the most important. So this is a map of Asia. And here it shows you Muscovite Tartaria which is basically Russian Central Asia. Eastern Chinesean Tartar, you would say Chinese Central Asia, Xinjiang. Well, obviously it doesn't match completely, but independent Tartar. Basically, the, that part of Central Asia that is neither controlled by Russia nor by China. In maps of this period, beside this part at the north that we don't recognize, the features, especially of the coast, is very modern. Especially the Dutch knew this part perfectly well in Indonesia because they, they dominated. It was their colonial empire. But all the coasts are extremely well designed. And the concepts are there are no sea monsters. There are no information about what's going on. This is a map that basically is just giving you a quite detailed view of the land.
Where is the PowerPoint? Oh. The other map I want to show you is this one. It's a map of China. This is really a map of China that is different from the others, meaning uh, not only is more accurate, but it is actually be made by measuring distances physically. I mean, people really went with ropes or chains in big stretches of land, and by triangulation, they would measure one side and then look at the angles on the other two sides and basically uh, plot a, a series of triangles over whole, whole wide territory so that their distances would be distances coming from accurate measurements on the ground. The French were doing that in France at the time. And the emperor, the Kansi emperor, that was very open to Western science, knew that they were basically very advanced in cartography. And so it's shown here as an image that he supposedly, I mean, it's shown this image it should be the Kansi emperor that gives command to these two missionaries, that Jesuit dressed in black, that's how the unique one. They go around the areas of China and take measures. Now, this is only the more general map of China, it's called Carte de la Rap, the most general map. So it includes uh, China, but it also includes Manchuria and Central Asia. Uh, I read that the coasts are as precise as matching our modern Google Maps by 98%. The coast has been measured with extreme accuracy. These are not people reading Marco Polo and making up how it would look like. It really went around and take measures. Now, this is in a certain sense the end because it's the time when Tartary stopped being a kind of concept that is connected with nomads and with a threat and symbols and monsters. This is really a time when Tartary is still on the map, Tartary should not be Chinese Tartary, but it's really what our modern Central Asia is. It doesn't change anymore. But this is a more detailed map of what they call Tartary Chinois, the Chinese Central Asia. The, these maps were done for the Kansi Emperor. They were printed in both Chinese and Manchu. We have facsimiles in, in, the, in the archive. And they were then translated in French and published in Paris. This is a map that has only the, what they call Carte Générale de la Chine, only the general map of China without the, the external parts. So it's only this part. And this allows me to tell you the last thing I wanted to tell you about old maps and modern board. So this is a kind of small diplomatic accident that happens. If you're curious, you can oh, click on this. Uh, it tells you that basically uh, um, Angela Merkel had Xi Jinping visiting. This is March 2014, a few years ago. Um, she. Uh, for Europeans, maps are mostly, these kind of maps are works of art. Okay, so uh, she basically, here she's giving him some kind of painting, and here she's giving him an ancient map. Actually, this map is simply a German reprint with some recoloring of exactly this map, which is called the general map of China. But the crucial part here is that maps can be used in many ways, and one of these ways is to claim that if uh, nation maps give you large borders, then you're entitled to these large borders. I mean, we see it really with the other time. And now there are people that say, oh, these Spanish maps show that the Philippines should be entitled to have the island. These other maps show you that it should be China. And actually, these maps don't really show borders in any clear way. They are just, they give you color lines to make sense of the space. But anyway, if Angela Merkel had given Xi Jinping this map, it would have been okay. This is a map that actually is the highest expansion of China, and more or less, even though the borders are not precise, it's a vast expanse. But she gave him basically, you can kind of recognize it a bit if you see that map and this map. It's just this part of China without the, the external part. And this map when went on the Xinhua news 
uh, was removed because it was considered that Angela Merkel was kind of trying to make a claim about what China should control or not control, especially considering the fact that there are human rights issues connected with Uyghur and, and Turks that want the independence for that area. And there are a lot of Turks in Germany. So there was a kind of conspiracy theory that Angela Merkel wanted to make a point about showing that China should be smaller than it is. And I'm sure she had no clue whatsoever uh, uh, about it. Uh, but I mean, the reading and misreading of maps is normal because maps are not only used to, to give you dry information about places, but they really give information about your whole image of life, world, and, and borders that became important actually only between 1700 and 1800. But people always project back these things and think that they always existed. And, and we always look for proofs. And many people look at these maps as having keys to who knows what kind of knowledge. But I hope that you get from my talk that at least the way I look at maps is simply as a way of giving a beautiful visualization of what people wanted to put very clearly in the open and in an entertaining way. And sure, mixing knowledge and, and entertainment. And there is no special hidden code in any of these maps. And this map should not be used for any political purpose. No. OK, this is my talk. Any, we, we kind of overstretch, but we have a few minutes if you have any questions. Just a very simple yeah. question. Why are maps mostly put in the in form of a square shape or rectangular shape? I saw a number of maps you shown us in a kind of round shape, right? Yeah. What's the reason now behind that? <laughs> well, let me go because we have this rare and special e zone where we have all these maps. I mean, some reasons when you talk about maps is simply that it's conventional. It's conventional. It's been done this way, and then this becomes the way to do it. But uh, it's also quite important to remember that all the maps we have, all the maps we have here, uh, and all the maps you will see upstairs, they come from books. So this, this when we scan this map, uh, it comes from a book, but it's detached. We only got one page, but we got the front and the back. So this is the front. This is the map of Tartaglia. This is the back. This is a, a Dutch uh, description of what is Tartars. So now, all these maps, the Dutch were very much. They would have at the front always this part in Latin. Everything here is in Latin. The title is in Latin. All the text that tells you what is going on, the great camp, is in Latin. At the back, they would give you a text depending where they wanted to export the, the text. Internal uh, sale for Dutch maps in the Netherlands, text in Dutch. But they would the same map would have a description in French, in Latin for people that were more cultivated, in German, in English, and so on. And they are all books. You can see this is just the back of the preceding one. And they are actually kind of glued together here to make them more solid. So they are in book format. So the book format necessarily gives you a square format. You just have a dividing line in the middle. It's always basically double, because all these maps are relatively large scale maps. If you see these books, they are like folio books. They are large books. Well, upstairs, we have two of them open. You see how they are. But basically, if you have manuscript maps, you can have them in any shape. Just like the, the first map we saw from, uh, from the <coughs> West, uh, let me get it back here, uh, manuscript and in a variety of shapes, uh, often, frankly speaking, because of real constraints, it has to be the shape of the neck of the animal. And you still see. But these other maps, uh, for example, this one, yeah, this, the, the word is sometimes rendered as a round. But still, the format is, is just, because of simple mechanical reason, the square share of, of a paper sheet. 
But if you will see one of these maps we have down there, it's a map of China that is round. Is round, just like this one. And it's a way to focus just on China. It's not a map of the world at all. It's not a globe. But it's round because this way, if you see the illustration, uh, but I don't have it online here. And the four corners, they can show you strange features about China. One of them, we saw it already, is wind car. And then another one is fishing by cormorants and so on. So there, another one is a strange cult they have of three-headed goddess. So they can fit the format. From their point of view, it, any format is OK. They have a kind of printer-painter approach to, to the landscape. But at the same time, the, and, and this one is more, the, the shape is really more like a globe. But uh, this one is manuscript. This one is a manuscript. But in general, this also is because it's a map of the world. But otherwise, there tends to be, you see, the older ones have more, more a wider range of, of formats. After that, some people say that basically the Dutch tradition of map making in 1600 is the Baroque era. Baroque era is an era that in art is very, how can I say, heavy. They don't leave any part empty. Every inch of, uh, of a page or a painting or a surface of a building is full with something. Nothing is left empty. Besides here, because there is a meaning, we don't know what is America. We don't know anything. But everything else is filled to the brim. So you have a page, you have a sheet with this uh, rectangular. If you want to fill it completely, then you keep the whole rectangular. So that, that's my simple kind of explanation. Uh, referring to your uh, map of uh, Great Qing of China, 1818, mm -hmm. if I could uh, draw your attention. Sorry. The map of China. The uh, which one? 1818. One in. The, the, the Chinese. Chinese one. Oh, the Chinese one. Yeah, yeah, 1818. Yes. Well, let's see if we can simply. Yeah. yeah actually, this is not uh, what we do in um, in the exhibition. We don't have this map because it's not really relevant to Tartary. But I wanted to show a different kind of map. So, yeah. so this map, indeed. Uh, was made and uh, publicized in 1818. Yes. Uh, I, did you say it's relatively accurate? No. <laughs> no. The, the map, uh, obviously, sometimes when we say accurate, we mean accurate by the time. So when I was showing you uh, the preceding maps here, this Camido map of 1402, this Korean map, is considered remarkably accurate for the time, for the inclusion of Africa and so on, in 1400. Uh, this map of Song China is, even just by the format, it has a kind of similarity to what we consider an accurate map that immediately makes you think, besides the fact that even here, they measure the coasts, and they found out the coasts are extremely accurate. They, they, they are connected with real measurements. Now, 1818. It is even puzzling because the Jesuit Matteo Ricci had published complete maps of the world in Chinese in, in the late Ming Dynasty. So they already had, if they, if they wanted an accurate map telling them how the world looked like, they simply had to go through printed books that were very common at the time. It was so strange. I was asking you this question because about 22 years later, when uh, Qing China was uh, was confronted with the opium issue, and then uh, the the Qing uh, official industry uh, was was coordinating with his associates to, to to make a map of the world so that they know what they are dealing with. So I was wondering if this sort of map indeed existed. Uh, why bother to make a map? of the world at the time, you know, went through all the trouble. Just like because you think it is accurate or? I, I, I don't know what the people at the time thought how accurate it was. Well, uh, they, many people really uh, go, there are ways to look at, at Chinese science in a way. And they often say in the Song Dynasty, Chinese science was a bit stopped. 
and then there was a, just like going backward and backward and it was the, really the loss of the scientific spirit. But I think in terms of maps, you don't need to assume that maps went backward. It's more like or that the, the understanding of space by people went backward. It's mostly that they decided to print things that were not Maps can, are symbols beside representations of Google Earth like reality. So they decided that that for them served as the symbol they wanted for how the world looked like to them. Now, obviously, if you think that in 20 years they start basically sending people with gunboats and, and, and colonizing the country, then obviously you think that. If that was the only image of the world they had, they were in deep trouble. But in reality, uh, the, the Kangxi Emperor had commissioned the, these maps of China. And not only he commissioned them, uh, it, it's an atlas. And uh, it, it's followed by a province by province uh, 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 each sheet uh, is one province. They're extremely accurate. Uh, basically, the most advanced project of, at that scale uh, about really serving a country. And not only this, it's not that they printed it once and then they left it and they just buried it and nobody would use it. They had three editions. You can see had one edition of this, then Yongzhang had one, Qianlong had one. We had the three sets upstairs. So 100 years they went on updating. These maps are very accurate. But Often you also have to wonder about the selection. I mean, this, this is a map. We got, you need to go into much more detail to, to find out how were these the only maps that were used? What was the real usage of these maps? Were these maps used when you had to decide official policy? Were these the maps that were used when the embassy from England was coming and you had to decide if you would accept their claim that they should be treated equally? Or were they using the preceding maps of the world for that? We, you need to go into the record. I don't have the answer for that. What I can say is that, sure, this map is a map that tells you much more about the world view of people than about the shape of a country as such. But it tells you things. It tells you things about the provincial capitals, what are the geographic, geographically speaking, in terms of geographical administration and hierarchy. It, it, it's, it tells you what you want to do. It gives you all the details about the population. Uh, but obviously, most people, and I agree, I mean, it would just say that it's a very inaccurate map if you judge maps by accuracy. And I'm sure they, w they could have had perfect map just by copying the, the, the preceding one, the English and the Dutch one, no problem. We have to go to okay, yeah, yeah, because of the logistics, we have to, <laughs> uh, I have to leave the first group upstairs. Yeah.